Today we begin a new series, as we will spend the next 12 weeks going over the book of 1 Timothy, and I'm excited for this, and here's why. 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus are three books in the Bible that are known as Paul's epistle, um, pastoral epistles. So like Galatians or Ephesians or 1st and 2nd Corinthians, those are other books found in the New Testament that are written by Paul, but these three letters were written to pastors of local churches concerning their duties in ministry. Timothy oversaw the church in Ephesus. It wasn't just one church. There was probably a couple small churches. He oversaw them. And, and, and Paul's focus here was to encourage him because the appointed overseer had his work cut out for him. The city of Ephesus was very wealthy and a very worldly city known for its, its riches, also for its practices of sorcery, debauchery, and, and worship of the goddess Artemis. But these two things were not the three, three things were not the only problem for the church in Ephesus. When Paul penned these epistles, false teaching were creeping in to the Christian church, and they were aggressive. Well, here we are, two thousand years later, and is it any different? You know, no. That's why what's so amazing about how God put the Word together, the Bible together, is that. Not only was this letter written to Timothy at a time where he really needed it, it's written to us today because we need it. Amen. I had to go old school on you to get a couple amens this morning. Come on now. (laughs) Today we know that people are lovers of self and lovers of money. We know that people are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We live in a time when people do not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. These are all statements written by Paul to Timothy. We need church leaders today who will follow the pattern of sound words. We need someone, a a form of ministers and churches all over the world who will preach the word in season and out of season. And we always need to make sure that those who preach the gospel are sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of evangelists. What does that mean? Paul's, Paul's trying to give Timothy some encouragement here. He's like, man, this is a tough job. It's a tough job. You need to stay focused. Stay lifted up. As we study the book of 1 Timothy, we're going to gain a full picture of the purpose of the New Testament church, how to conduct it, as well as ourselves. Because if the gospel and sound doctrine are to advance into the next generation, the church leaders and the congregation must have the encouragement and the warnings in place so we can understand and help each other better. We serve a God who has a perfect plan, even if we're not realizing that yet. Let's humble ourselves in prayer this morning, please. Father God, thank you for bringing us all together. Thank you for loving us redeeming us to live in you. We pray, Lord, that you'd please open our eyes to hear your, to see your words this morning. Open our eyes to really see your words this morning and open our ears to hear them. Please write your words upon our hearts so that we are blessed by understanding this better today. And we ask you, Lord, to go before us by your spirit and help us just in our lives. I do not want to get in the way of preaching the message in which you need preached this morning. So I pray, Lord God, that you would speak by way of your spirit through me to your children. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Please turn your Bibles, if you have them, to the book of 1 Timothy. That is in the back side of the New Testament, if you're just learning where things are at. If you don't have them with you, don't fear. It's going to be on the screen behind me. For those of you who watch later on, it'll be on the bottom of your screen. We're going to open up with the first two lines of um, the letter, 1 Timothy 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise God for the opening of his word. I don't know that I always paid attention to everything I've ever read in the Bible. I don't think any of us have. Sometimes we're just kind of flowing along, and then we kind of go, wait, what? 
right? Have you done that? I started paying more attention, closer attention here, to the beginning of books in the Bible. I, this one is one of them, because it's a letter. The original context of what was written here is a letter that Paul wrote to his brother Timothy. Now he says, he calls him to Timothy, my true child in the faith, and in the second letter, he calls him his child. Is he a kid? Is he his kid? No. Child in the faith. When an older disciple is, is teaching or disciple making a younger person, you are doing what? Or, or let, and I don't mean age, I mean in faith walk time. When you're discipling somebody, whether younger or older than you in age, what are you doing? They're a child in the faith and you are helping them along. This is called discipleship. This is what Jesus told us to do before he left. Go, therefore, and dig yourself rabbit holes and conspiracy theories. No, he said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I've commanded you, and I'll be with you always to the end of the age. That's our commission. It's called the Great Commission for a reason. As Christians, no matter how difficult that may seem, how daunting of a task it might seem to, as a mountain that you want to climb, or, or whatever the situation is, it is still the command that we must go there for and make disciples. But Paul is addressing Timothy, and he, what he is doing is he is setting up what he's doing. It's called a letter. I know y'all only are doing emails these days. And most of you just get to the point, you never greet anybody. And let me explain something to you when you wrote a letter. Well, how did you open the letter? Dear beloved so-and-so, or, you know, dear Randy, hope you're doing well, blah, blah, blah. There's a letter. He states right away that he's apostle. Why is this, why is this important? So, because I want to think about this word for a minute, Apostle. Today's church culture and age, we see this name being tossed around a lot, like candy. And I know, I know some brothers in the Lord, in faith, I've met over the years who, are, who call themselves apostles. But here's why that's problematic. They haven't existed since the first century. Allow me to explain. The term disciple and apostle and, and apostle are often confused. Although the terms are interchangeable, they are not the exact same synonym, synonym. A disciple is defined in the Bible as a learner. So a disciple maker would then be what? A teacher. Okay? Though the apostles were disciples, not all disciples became apostles. And the apostle, actual, the term means one who was sent. An apostle enjoyed a special office in the New Testament church in the first century because he was commissioned by Jesus to go and was sending him to minister, to preach, to develop the New Testament church because Christ had come. Amen. We're in the first century church here. Christianity is getting going. They've got to do this. This is a commission to them. But here is, the, the, this is factual what I'm going to tell you. Here's what constituted an apostle. Three things. One is a disciple of Jesus during his earthly ministry. That was the first call. The second one was an eyewitness of the resurrection. And three, called and commissioned directly by Christ. Today, if a person claims to be an apostle, the only thing that they can claim that would even be remotely true is number three. You have to have all three. Now, this raises one thing, though, here. There were 12 initially. Judas Iscariot killed himself. He hung himself after he had betrayed Christ. He was replaced by a guy named... I, I'm so grateful that you guys did that. I had like five people say that because the last time I said it, I had one, Randy. And this time I heard five voices. His name was Matthias. So there's 12. 
However, there was a 13th. <laughs> Uh-oh. This guy named Saul of Tarsus, who I was so blessed that Sarah shared that story this morning. One of my favorite stories in the book is Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Hater of Christians. On his way there with papers in his pocket to go arrest him, to kill him, jail him, do whatever he can to tear this way down, this Christianity down. And Jesus appears to him. Now, his call was confirmed by the other 12. That's the difference here. Folks, let me explain something to you. If somebody comes up to you and states that they're something, but they're, you're not sure, right? Does that make it true? So the 12 apostles are clearly not going to take another guy into the fold unless they all 12 know that this man's telling the truth. And this man was telling the truth. He had eyewitnesses to his miraculous change on the road to Damascus, and they confirmed it. And he was the apostle to the Gentiles. That's why Paul was brought into the fold. Okay? By the late first century, however, the apostles had all died, and the apostolic authority was subordinate to the original apostles. But there are no official apostles today because Jesus is our ultimate apostle. He was sent by God the Father to us. He called them others, and he commissioned them to go forward. We don't need any more apostles today. We have pastors and elders and deacons. We have church leaders. We are called overseers. We teach the gospel. We spread the gospel, and all of you are ministers of the gospel. If, even if you're not a deacon or an elder or a pastor, you're called to be a minister of the gospel. You are a part of what we call in the Bible a royal priesthood so therefore all of us are exactly the same we get up every day put our britches on the same way nobody is cooler than another in Christ's eyes but what we are is called to do the work in which he has called us to do Amen. I have this beautiful understanding of, of what this apostleship is now, but I didn't always. I referred to a couple guys that I knew back in the day as apostle, and I'd almost, you know, bow down to them because, oh, they're an apostle. They're self-appointed or somebody else appointed them, but they're not appointed by God. Okay? Three through 11, which reminds me, by the way, um, you and I talked about it one time, Miss Mindy, about the red carpet being rolled out. Guy rolled up as an apostle, and he had a driver. And he couldn't talk to people because he had to get to his next church. Sounds an awful like a singer or an actor in Hollywood, amen? Yeah, yeah come on now. Come on. I'll put her pants on the same way. 3 through 11, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia... Remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So strong language, man. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. There's a lot there. We're going to break this down a little bit. Look, first and foremost, hard pressed to find a city in the world. That was as fertile soil for false doctrine as Ephesus was. 
They're located in modern day uh, western part of Turkey. Ephesus was the capital of the Roman province of Asia, and it was a political, commercial, and a religious hub. And here's the interesting thing about it. Do you know that Ephesus at one time had what contained one of the seven wonders of the ancient world? <laughs> it was called the Temple of Artemis. And this is obviously a rending, rendering because it was built in 535 BC. I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but there were no cameras then. <laughs> what? This is an artist rendering um, based on the historical size measurements of the building that were taken back then. And you can see how small the people are on this rendering, right? Compared, there were a hundred columns um, that were massive that held up the roof. It was something else. Um, beautiful building. Well, it was actually when Alexander the Great was born, um, somebody burned it and uh, created it, destroyed a lot of it. And then they kept it kind of going for a number of years. Um, and I think it finally collapsed, I would think around 300 AD. So it was, it was up for a bit, at least part of it was. But this is an interesting, uh, uh, you know, renderings just so you get an idea why it was the seventh wonder of the world. Um, but there's a large Jewish community who had settled in um, Ephesus, and they were transplanted from Israel. So when Timothy's here and he's trying to get the church of Christ going, he's up against the pagan worship of a goddess. He's up against the Jewish people who are rejecting Jesus Christ. He's up against however many other religions, Right? And the problem is, isn't that he's fa that he can't exist as a church next door to a church that's not a Christian church. It's that people were coming into the church trying to teach a different doctrine than the one we find here. Okay, so as long as we're clear on that understanding, yes, other religions exist. Yes, other denominations exist. We don't have time to go into all these reasons this morning, but there is a purpose for everything. Our job here is to teach the gospel and do what we can to get it right. Everything we can to get the gospel right. And we're not the only church doing that. Every church feels like they're doing that. But if you're preaching the entire word, you've got to preach even the difficult parts like we just read a moment ago. Because there's always people who read that and they're like, do -da, do -da, do -da. <laughs> sin is sin. But if you love God, you keep his commandments. And if you love the Lord God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Our job is to love. Can't change a, a serial killer. Right? They're going to do what they're going to do. You can't change anybody from their sin. He can. Your job is to do the best on you. When we realize here that we are teaching the truth, we cannot bow to the culture. I am a, I'm a teacher of the gospel. I'm not a political or cultural pundit. I'm not going to avoid the practice of homosexuality because Drop Dead Fred made a living out of hating people on it. Go away over there on the west side of Topeka. But it's what the gospel says. And you know we have people in this church who have turned away from a homosexual lifestyle? Did you know that? We do. You don't need to know who they are. Do they need to know your sins? Yeah, exactly, right? Amen? We all got them. So when we read something that's offensive, does that make us close the Bible and move on from there? No, it can't. Do you don't think we're convicted every time we read something that we're doing? Amen to somebody. <laughs> we're doing something sinful and we're reading it. And it feels like it's on every other page. We're like, really, God? Really? Amen? And most of the time, it's what? Sexual immorality. Could have heard a pin drop in every church when that was said. Amen? Because it, it constitutes everything that goes against what God has asked us to do. Are people going to do it? Yes. Are they free to do it? Yeah. Does it please God? No. Does it make you feel better? 
No. You live a life in sin long enough, you begin to detest yourself and you have pain. The freedom of the gospel is not about being more religious. The freedom of the gospel is that he says to you, come to me, ye who are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My burden is light. He died for those who would repent and believe in him. You don't have to climb ladders of religiosity to love Christ. You just have to love Christ. But if you love him, be prepared that he's going to rock your world. It's going to shake your foundation. When I truly decided that that was okay with me, I knew that that's the only thing I wanted. Because my life stunk. And I was tired of hurting. Anybody else ever felt that way before? Sometimes when you're broken, you understand, God, I can't do this life. I need you. I need you. Well, what happens a lot of times is that we don't want to get in line with what he's teaching us. But that is something that we've got to look at now. Then the aim of our charge in verse 5 is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. What does that mean? Because he's talking right before that, what does he say? He's, he, was, he was making a comment, you know, I urge you before that you may uh, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Well, what is endless genealogies? Let's answer that before we move on to what our take aim is, okay? Endless genealogies were something that were extremely popular back in the day. They were, there was a book that was taught, it was a devotional book by the Jewish people, it was called the Book of Jubilees. I tried. I can't. Couldn't do it. It is it's so boring. Amen. Anybody who has ever read the Book of Jubilees, have you ever read it? It's endless genealogies about from Genesis onward. Any, look, the point is, is that, you know, a lot of times we're reading the Old Testament. Like what we're doing is we're going back here and Genesis seems to be cool. It's a historical book. It's really interesting. We get into Exodus and everything's fine. until so he starts talking about these laws. These laws that he's implementing come right after, right after they made a golden calf to worship it because they didn't want to wait for Moses to come down from Mount Sinai. It was punishment. The laws of the Old Testament are punishment. The genealogies are there for what? Historical purpose. Uh, people will say to me like, uh, yeah, I started reading in the Bible and they start talking about so-and-so beget, beget, and I was done. Same person spends three hours on 23 and me researching their family history. Amen. Right? Uh, if, look, the genealogy is there for history. You don't have to read it. But don't stop reading the only book, the only instruction manual for your life because of genealogy and ancestry that's documented. It's documented to bring validity to this book to show us that it is the word of God. This isn't a collection of famous dance song lyrics. This is the word of God assembled in 66 books so we have a little bit of everything in it. If it bores you, move on. In the book, but don't move on to outside of the book. You know, if Leviticus bothers you or Deuteronomy, go read Ephesians. But start somewhere and stay with it and invest in your learning. If you want to be closer to God, you've got to draw near to him by reading his word. That's how he speaks to us. He didn't call you up on your AT&T phone. He impresses upon you by, your, by the spirit, through the spirit. That's how you feel him. It feels like he's right here talking to us. When he leads us, when we're drawing near to him, he impresses on us, go call this person. Hey, that person needs help. You ever get that? Well, you're not hearing an audible voice, but it feels like it, but he's telling you through the spirit, this is what you got to do. The more you draw near to God, the more this becomes a real thing. 
No, I'm not crazy. I'm the most practical person I know. I'm the most skeptical human being I ever met in my entire life. God has proven it to me that there is a portion of this faith walk that is absolutely supernatural. I'm not hearing voices. I think about people and I pray for people that I never prayed for before because the Holy Spirit's letting me know. Patrick, pray for this person. Okay, I'll drop right there and pray because that means that person needs prayer at that very moment. I had that happen three times this week and I'm gonna name the people that I had to do it. AJ, you were one of them. Jacob Harmon was another. And um, your brother, Andrew, I just impressed, boom. I had to pray that, that moment for those people. I'm gonna name them because do you ever have this happen? Amen. Would you shout loud for the people in the back? Do you ever have this happen? Amen. Okay, it does happen. I can't explain it. I don't have to. But when I'm looking at the truth, I'm looking at things of the word of God that are gonna help me understand him better. So when you're reading the book of Jubilees, is that helping edifying the church? No. And that's what they were doing. They were literally coming in. I'm, going to use, I'm not going to use the Bible because I don't want to use that as an example. I'll use the hymnal. <laughs> Might as well be a book of Jubilee sometimes. So I can't read music. So, but I can read words. But they were coming in with the book of Jubilee and they were trying to teach the Christian church old law. What are you, what are you doing? Poor Timothy, man. He's just like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. I'm up against all of this. Dude, man, probably wanted to quit a thousand times. Timothy gets a letter from Paul. Hey, I got you. Show him this letter. I'm an apostle sent by Christ. I'm writing you a letter. So Timothy's getting a letter from one of the only 13 apostles to ever live outside of Christ, the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. And he shows them, stop teaching this, this, this knuckleheadedness. You and your, your endless genealogies, quit it. Your, your nonsensical teachings, this has nothing to do with the body of believers. And so Timothy takes the pulpit back over and he goes, no, Christ crucified Buried, dead, risen, rose. That's what I'm going to teach you. That's what he was teaching them. It's tough on the brothers. Teach this from the pulpit week in and week out. You need to pray for them. And I'm not talking about me. I mean brothers everywhere. Brothers and sisters in the church who are teaching people. We, we, we all, all church leaders. You know, Think of this one. Think of this book of Jubilee that managed its way in. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm not going to get into women at the pulpit right now. But I'm going to tell you this. That doesn't mean that women can't be teaching. Our children need it. Women need it. Women need other women to teach them. Sound doctrine. So oh, we've made a habit in the church to go, oh, the women's group, they're doing their own thing. And what do you think is going to happen when the women aren't thinking about discerning through the stuff? Here come all these crazy, weird women, you know, oh, I got this new one from Lisa Turkhurst or whatever her name is, and we're just going to teach this one. Uh, that just is an example, but there's a lot of them out there that are false teachers, Hoping this, and teach what the book says. Quit trying to find the person who's done it the best way, who makes you feel warm and joyful. Life is not warm and joyful. Life is hard and it hurts. Teach the truth because this admonishes those of us who have been through loss who have been through cancer, who are going through a hard time in life, scared to the one day to the next of what's going to happen to us. The gospel appeals to our heart when nobody else will. The world will just tickle your ears with everything you want to hear. 
It's why Joel Osteen's popular. It's why Joyce Meyer's popular. You know, because they're cheerleaders. They're spokespeople for the cheerleaders of America. People don't know that they got sin. They know they got sin. They don't need to hear about it. No, they don't. That's why you can't sleep at night. That's why you got anxiety. That's why you got depression. That's why. Because you got sin that has not been dealt with before God. And you'll never get better until you confess it. Amen. That's what he encourages us to do, man. I'm the furthest this cat from being perfect. And if I told you all the gnarly things I did in my life, you would not want me to be at your pulpit. Amen, everybody. Amen. Ain't not one of us can do this from what we've done. But we can help be a light to other people based on what Christ has done. It is through him and him alone. Our aim, the aim of our charge is, is love that issues from a pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. Guys, the pure heart. Are we approaching each day that we wake up and thank God that he gave us life? How are we loving him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength? If we're not, it's never too late to begin. But this world it teaches us to be antagonistic to be vile towards other people, to be um, harsh and narcissistic. But you go to bed and you're sad because that's what the world does for your cup. Your heart cup is full of black, gnarly sledge that was once something good. And you know it until you pour it out and you fill it up with his truth. The good conscience. We, do we conduct ourselves with integrity? Or are we doing people dirty who did us dirty? Just asking. Right? Good conscience is surety and faith in Christ. Christ alone. We put our best forward, expecting nothing in return. We do things where the right hand does it and the left hand doesn't see it doing it. That's, that's what a good conscience is. I had one of those moments, and I'm just going to share uh, transparency. I lost a really good friend of mine from school uh, Friday. And we, we, we spent a lot of time together. Had our first band together. We, we played in the stage band at Highland Park together, jazz band for a couple years. Man, we ran around together for a long time. And I didn't see him. You know, life happens. We separated and I learned later on that he, he is married and was awesome. Reached out to him. He had two kids. I had two kids. His wife died. And then a couple years later, my wife died. And, you know, we talked, but we just didn't reconnect. Sadly, we really reconnected when I found out that he was in hospice care. So I show up at, his, at the hospice house two months ago. And we sit and have one of the coolest conversations. It was like... 34 years had not even elapsed. You ever have those conversations? You run into somebody, it's like you just talked to them yesterday, but it's been 25 years ago. I had that conversation with him. It was so amazing. And we had several more talks. On Friday, he died. He had brain, lung, liver cancer. He was 55 pounds at his death. Looked like a skeleton. And on Friday night, I took to social media and said, I'm going to miss you. Put some pic a couple pictures of us back in the day together. And I got woke up by the Spirit of God, 3 o'clock in the morning. Take that down. And I thought, oh, I was just trying to honor him. But I looked at the comments, and there they go. So sorry for your loss. So sorry for your Hang on, time out. His mom and dad were there with him when they had to bury their kid. That's who I'm sorry for. Now, I appreciate well wishes because it hurts. And it's nice when a brother or sister sends you a message. That means different. The people on Facebook don't care. They don't know they don't care. They're just saying it because you posted something about a loss. So sorry about your loss. And they go about their day praying for you. Good vibes. Good vibes going your way. Oh, because those are going to help. 
you ever send to me good vibes, you are immediately stricken from my phone. <laughs> you would have said White Castle cheeseburgers, totally different. But I had a, I had a, I had a, st- I wake up and the Holy Spirit woke me up and he's like, this ain't about you. And I'm like, I didn't mean to make it about me, but that's exactly how it came off. Does that make sense? I deleted that and fine. Well, he, his memory's here. Uh, him, nothing will ever take that away from me. I've got a brother that I will have forever. And I pray I get to see him again one day. But we don't know what we're doing until we focus in on God sometimes. And we move to verses 6 and 7, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work to the close now with this. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. This is important. Paul's taking a shot at the, the, the uber-legalistic religious. And, and those who approach their teachings with legalism and not of the things of the Lord, this is really common then, and it's common now. Right? We, we, not to name names or protect, we're going to protect the innocent. But there are churches who have denied other people membership because they were sprinkled and not dipped. And there are some churches that, that deny membership of a person because they were dipped and not sprinkled. And there are probably some that deny people because they don't think they've had a bath in a week. I don't know. But these kind of errancies are running amok within the church. Does that make the church, does that make, hold on a minute and think about this. Does that make you stay out of church? Does that make you stay away from God because of how you were treated by somebody in the church? Stop, don't answer. Answer in here. Because those of you who said nope, there's 50 people who said yes. We get hurt. Fair. But I am no longer going to leave anything to get in the way between me and a holy God, especially another human being. And if you're somewhere and they teach you something funky, research it. Why do we not do that anymore? You know, I, God bless you guys because I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of you in here today. And I'm really, really, really proud of many of you who have overcome some of the bad stuff, the theology and the teachings that you had to endure. But here you are today, in spite of what had happened bad to you, but now you're loving God because you're working through it. But some of you came in and you were like, I'm like, hey, been a welcome, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, yeah, the church is stupid, and I don't know why I'm here, and I've got problems, and praise God. I did the exact same thing. But I'm not letting anything get between me and my Savior. Nothing. 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 Amen? Now, he talks about this law. And I'm going to make this, and I'm going I'm to close I'm going to break this down for a quick understanding. The law, the law that we read about, that he is referring to in Timothy. He says, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient. And then he lists the sins. So, so what we're talking about here is that people use the law. What does the law mean? Well, the law's purpose of the Old Testament was to, to reveal our transgressions. Think of it like this. Think of the law and what you read in the, all the Old Testament law and the rules as a mirror. Okay? So when you look in a mirror, what do you see? You. The law makes you point to you. And what you do when you do this is that you realize that you lack holiness. You lack the ability to not sin. You lack um, um, not being depraved. You are a, a born into depravity. You are born, according to scripture, you are born depraved. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody is perfect. Nobody's that cool. We're all born into sin. We're all wretched sinners. I am a worm, myself deserving of hell. I'll admit it. If it wasn't for the grace of an almighty God who sent his son to die on the cross, that's who we serve. And that's who you can serve today. Jesus is the perfect and blemished lamb of God. And notice as he says, contrary to sound doctrine. Sound doctrine comes from the word of God. It comes from study of the word of God. I remember in, I read a book. Some of you might have read it back in the day. Um, it's a few hours from my life that I'll never get back. 
It's by Joseph Fletcher. It was called Situation Ethics. Anybody gorge that thing down? Okay, so Situation Ethics was based on whatever love demands. Love is love is love is love is love. Okay, well, you know, there's no bigger love than that of God's love. There's no bigger love than that of who he'll, he forgives you and I. His grace and mercy is so rich and so vast, I don't know what I'd do without him. But there are parameters. I can't kill you. I can't kill you, get away with it from a civil legal standpoint. But because of my love for God, he changes me. And because I'm to love my neighbor, I don't want to kill you anymore. There are people in this room, and I venture to say that about everybody in this room, at one point had thought about how to take somebody out with a ball bat to the back of the kneecaps. And if you say no, you lie and your breath stank. Because we're born into evil world. But God changes us. He molds us into somebody who doesn't wish hateful stuff on people anymore, but we want to love people. That is only something that God can do, not religion. It's transformation. 1 John 5, 3 says this, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And what about his commandments? They're not burdensome. When I think about 1 Timothy, I think about Paul's call to the future, um, the leaders of the future church. He says, we got to leave it better than what we found it. Amen? So we've got to get back into teaching the roots, even if it offends people. Sin is sin. You love people through it in spite of that. Did you know that we have people in this church who used to be homosexual? Did you know that? We have people in this church, and I don't know who they are. You don't know who they are, but they probably still struggle with maybe some of those lustful temptations. We have people in this church sitting here today who have a pornography problem. We have people here sitting here today who might have an addiction that they don't, haven't shared with anybody. You guys, this is a human body the human life, and that's who, unfortunately, we are. But it is the one who came and set us free that can set us free. And all we got to do is repent and believe in him. He, he who died and bled for us and rose again on the third day. Pray with me, please. Father God, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for letting us find a love for you that we might have never had before. Let us seek you with clarity. This life is never promised to us. We do not know from one day to the next if we're going to live. I'm so grateful, Lord, that we had um, a memorial service for a, a wonderful man who of, of, of represented you so well yesterday, um, and Brother Tim. And I pray, Lord God, that you be with his family. I also pray, Lord God, that you would allow us to be, uh, as we move on and remember those people, like Brother Buddy, and Brother Tim, and every other brother or sister who has died before us, who has loved you, that we use their lives as a memory of how to live a life to seek after you. When I remember praying about it, and, and Tim asked me, he said, please remind them that I, I'm going home to my king. What a, what a beautiful request from a brother. And I pray, Lord God, that everybody here today will remember that you are our king. And if they've never surrendered to you as their king, today is the day of salvation. Would you soften the heart and break down the heart of stone and give to us a heart of flesh that will love you instead of turn away from you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.